Welcome, everyone. It's Tuesday afternoon, and this is the HockeyDebates.com podcast. And today we're joined by a special guest, a three-time Olympian, a two-time gold medal winner, Sammy Joe Small. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, Olympics. We're going to talk about women's hockey, and we're going to learn a whole lot today. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome again. And uh, as I'm Bob Duff, and that's my co-host, Kevin Allen. And today, as we said, our guest is... Sammy Joe Small, a three-time Canadian Olympian. And uh, Sammy, the question we always start with when someone writes a book, obviously that's why you're here to talk about your book. And uh, why don't we show your book right now while we're talking about it? Uh, there it is, Sammy Joe Small, the role I played. And let's talk about the role you played and also why you wanted to write a book. Well, those are two really big questions. Um, <laughs> I think that let's start with first why I wanted to write the book. Um, it's been something that I have wanted to do for a long time now. And I started journaling when I was with the national team, um, keeping logbooks of my training regimens, of uh, games, um, using it as a tool at the time. Um, but when I retired from the national team, or essentially was cut from the national team, um, I had all this documentation, I had all this information, and I was starting to work as a full-time speaker. So I'm a professional speaker doing corporate and association events, and a lot of speakers have books. And I thought, you know, I'll just quickly write a book, put it at the back of the room, and, and sell a couple after events and make a little bit more money. But once I started to get really into it and I started to really write the book, I realized that the the stories that I was, were, was writing about were bigger than me. It wasn't just about me. It was about this amazing time in women's hockey that was transformative and um, really included a lot of really incredible women. And I wanted their stories to be told as well. I wanted our story as a team to be told. And so it took me some time, it took me some time to do the research and to ensure that I got the timelines right and I got the characters right. Um, I had a daughter along the way, so parenthood came on and that, that's just a whole nother gambit. So uh, once she went to kindergarten, that was really when I, I pulled it off the shelf and decided that I was gonna um, go to a publisher and um, ended up with East Press. And um, it's been, basically about a year since I've been with them and sort of been in their in their trajectory. And um, then the pandemic hit and that was the time for me to publish the book. Uh, Sammy, uh, the, when we uh, think about women talking now, um, it seems like it's pretty mature, uh, especially for people um, who have been around a while. They know that it started, I remember covering the Women's World Championships in Kitchener in the early 1990s. But really, it's still in its infancy. And I, when I look at it, I, I think about how far women's hockey has come. Like, I remember what it was like in the early 1990s. And now I look at it now and just the level of sophistication and the competitiveness of it and the, the talent level. Um, and can you kind of speak to that as someone who was, you know, involved in the first Olympic participation and have seen it uh, grow uh, to where it is today? For sure, you're right. I think that we are we are at a, a pivotal time in women's hockey because it it really can go in so many different directions. Um, you know, I think to say um, it's in its infancy, we've gone through a lot of different cycles of infancy. And um, you know, I w I grew up at a time in Winnipeg when it was unacceptable for girls to play hockey. There was no girls hockey teams. Um, and what I was doing was different. But I found out later after. Um, going through the historical data, writing this book, that there was periods in time in the last century where women did play a lot of hockey. And I think that that is a testament to the society and where it was at various different times, treating women in um, you know different ways through the last century and the opportunities that we had as women. Um, and so what I am incredibly proud of now is in Canadian society, that um, you know, we're starting to see a, a difference in uh, opportunities that there once were now available for women in all different aspects. So, you know, I think that young girls can now aspire to do and be anything. Now it just comes down to what we get paid to do those endeavors. But I love that I can walk into a rink now and see little girls with a hockey bag over their shoulder and it just be normalized. And I, I guess I really felt that at the very first Olympics, I was very lucky to be a part of. And 
we had a lot of various different people on that team. We had women that had fought for this right to play this game. We had people that had been around um, for for a long time when it uh, wasn't accepted and it wasn't um, in the newspapers. It wasn't written about um, the people like Francois Louis, like Stacey Wilson, that were, um, you know, true pioneers in the game. And then there's my generation that came behind them that really reaped the rewards of everything that they did. Um, but there was a whole generation before them that never got to play that, you know, maybe got to play when they were little or played with their brothers a little bit on the, on the, on the rinks in their backyard. But um, it just is amazing how far it really has come. And I am, um, you know, while a lot of people will say uh, right now in women's hockey, there's, um, you know, the question of, uh, of pay and having a professional league for women. I just love that we're able to even have those conversations because that would not have been the case even a decade ago that we would be in a place where uh, we could fight for these rights. It's not simply about playing hockey anymore. It's not about um, showing people that we have a good product because people know that. It's now sort of that next steps and you know what kind of opportunities do we have for these young girls um, post-college because now there's so many opportunities at the collegiate level, at the provin provincial level, at the national level and the international level. So. It certainly has come a long, long way. And I think the 10 years that I write about in this book is really sort of that pivotal moment where it went from obscurity to part of the national fabric. I remember when I was in college, I coached in the MTHL with the Toronto East Enders. And at that time, it wasn't my age group that she was trying to play in, but that was when Justine Blaney was going to court for the right to be able to play in the MTHL. And, you know, even though I wasn't my team, it still gave me a lot of pride that it was our organization that fought to get her that right. And she ended up playing for our organization. Yeah. And that's an amazing story of Justine Blaney and her, her, her fight and how it not only took over uh, boys hockey at the time, but also women's hockey. You know, I think within women's hockey you had to think about what is the place in the game and, I was really lucky to get to play with Justine Blaney when I joined my first professional team, uh, the Brampton Thunder. And I wouldn't have been able to play growing up had she not won that court case. So, you know, it's it's amazing how it kind of came full circle. But she she suffered a lot because of it. I think she didn't get to play in the MTHL for uh, at least a year, maybe two years while the court case was going on. So who knows what kind of player she could have ended up becoming. She was still such a great player, but um, she never did make it to the national level. And maybe it's because she you know, had to go through this um, to allow the rest of us to be able to come through that um, uh, behind her as she sort of changed the course of women's hockey. And then my time working in Windsor, obviously got to know Megan Agosta quite well. And uh, there was a couple of coaches who tried to, she was playing in the boys high school league in Windsor after she'd come back from the 2006 Olympics. And there were a couple of coaches who tried to get her banned from the league and I said, Megan, you, look how far you've brought women's rights. It used to be they didn't want you to play because you're a girl. They don't want you to play because you're too good. <laughs> yeah. It's very true. It was amazing to see in 2006, Megan, at, you know, when she was trying out for the team, she was 17 or 18 years of age at the time. And we played in the boys' uh, AAA midget loop in Alberta. And um, so she's playing against peers her own age. And He's just as good, if not better, than these boys. And a lot of the boys went on to play in the NHL. Um, it was just it really amazing to see just how far it had come because, you know, we were a decade older than her at the time. Um, but for her to be on par at that age uh, was pretty incredible. Now, you're I'm interested in your uh, your sports background in general. You've played pretty much everything. You were a, a volleyball player. You were a badminton player. And you actually went to Stanford on a track and field scholarship and played goal for the men's hockey team. I did. You know, I, I grew up at a time when, um, like I said, women's hockey was really not acceptable. So there wasn't really as many opportunities. There was no national team. There's no Olympics for us to aspire to. So I think part of the reason I got to play all these other sports was I wasn't uh, pigeonholed into one sport early. I wasn't, um, there wasn't a ton of pressure on young girls to play or perform. Um, so I got to play all these different sports. And, you know, before I became a parent here in the GTA, I used to encourage other people to, um, you know, make sure that your kids play a bunch of different sports and um, don't uh, let them uh, pick one too early. 
But now I realize that in the GTA, that's really hard. It's really hard when somebody gets home from work at five o'clock, drives for an hour to get to, to a game, uh, plays the game, and then you know might have multiple children trying to do that with and then getting them involved in different sports. So I think now what I encourage is more of a balance. So to find other passions, and that doesn't have to necessarily be other sports, although I do think other sports are really good at um, just for your overall mental health and mental well-being and your physical well-being. Um, but it could be something as simple as um, ensuring that you walk your dogs every day or uh, learning how to play the piano or something you could do maybe in your time when you're in the car on the way to a certain sport um, to just really ensure that you have balance in your life. Um, and I think that goes to kids and uh, adults as well. So that, you know, I know for me, when I became a full-time hockey player, the, the hardest thing was to not dwell on the last night's practice or the last night's game. It, um, played so much on my my psyche because I used been used to playing all these different sports, going from one to the next, and I think that that's what allowed me to come up, become a better hockey player. Was I played all these different roles on some in some sports I was horrible and I was the worst, and in others I was really good and, and excelled. So it made me realize sort of all the different um, types of individuals it takes to have on a team, and it made me um, have to you know always fight to be better and always push myself to be better. And if I had a bad game in one sport, you know, five minutes later, I'm in a car on the way to the next one. So it, uh, you couldn't linger too long on one. Uh, what's interesting to me about uh, women's hockey is, is that when it debuted uh, at the Olympics, it, it instantly became one of the most important sports at the Winter Olympics. There was an energy about it in 1998 that I remember that, uh, that it, you know, the fan base and the television cameras immediately embraced. And that stayed constant. You know, I've covered every Olympics since then. And it's always an important aspect of the Olympics. And even when I went to the World Championships here in Michigan a couple of years ago, there was an energy, that same international energy. The building was full. It was exciting. Everybody was there. But we haven't been able to translate that beyond the international competition. And I'd love to get your thoughts on, um, you know, what's kind of held it back uh, uh, or if you even see it as being held back and uh, what can be done to sort of uh, bring that energy that comes from the international game and have it, you know, in between the Olympic uh, uh, Olympians. For sure. I think you're so right, Kevin, that there is a certain, there is an energy around the game and anybody that's ever watched it or been to a game, I think uh, becomes a fan for life. But sometimes the hardest thing is finding out when that next game is going to be, you know, how, how yeah. do you, and see another game. How do I watch these women play? Um, so I think we've battled with that within the game uh, for a long time, is how do we bring uh, the fan base that we know is there, you know, over 10 million people watch Kiss Canada, watch the last game um, on TV. So we know the fan base is there. We know the product is good. Um, and it's just sort of bringing those two together, which I think at times we struggle with. I think within the game, to me, I think the issue has been uh, the financial backing, and that's at you know at all levels. Um, however, when we started the CWHL in 2007, we started with a budget for the entire league of $360,000, and we operated on that budget for that year, and slowly progressed to uh, the last year of the CWHL before its demise of $3.7 million. So with that came bigger crowds, bigger games, more marketing. Um, I was the GM of the Toronto Furies in the very final season, and uh, we averaged over 500 people a game, which might not seem like a lot, but it's a lot better than just the parents and the family and friends in the stands. Um, we would play in some big venues uh, where we had some marketing, so we would market two or three games per year and get um, three to 5,000 people. So we played at the ACC, we played at some big venues. Um, so when you know there is that ability to put the money behind the product, I know for myself as a GM, I and even working on the league initially, I struggled with, um, do you try to get fans in the seats or do you try to get sponsorship dollars? Like how do you bring in your money? Because getting fans in the seats takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy to sell that individual ticket for whatever, $15, $20, versus going to a sponsor and getting $10,000. So initially the way we started the CWHL was with sponsorship money because we wanted to provide the best playing environment for these girls. We wanted the product to be great. We wanted um, their uh, ice time, the 
uh, you know, the accommodations around the actual operations of the game to be as strong as it could before we started to try to look at bums in the seats. So I think that's really the next step in women's hockey is the bums in the seats to make it look uh, more like what we see as professional sport. Um, and I think that's possible. So unfortunately, the the business or the people that were involved in the CWHL in the end um, uh, perhaps didn't run it um, in a way that allowed it to operate for the next season, we'll say, in a very non-political way. Um, so to me, that is not because women's hockey failed. That to me is a business failure. And I think we have to separate those two because that doesn't mean by any means that that affects any of the younger levels or development of the game or the fact that we have this amazing product. Um, there still exists the NWHL. Uh, I think that they're doing a great job in their markets of really pushing the game and, and showing that uh, people want to see this game. And so now to me, what the next step are is these you know two factions two sides now that um i think really just need to come to the table and figure something out uh with either the nhl or the next steps so now for me as a fan i mean i'm like you guys i just i want to support the game i want to cheer for these girls and i want somewhere that i can go and do that um you know i don't care how that happens i don't care what the ultimate uh league is that the that it happens in um i just want to be able i mean i just i love watching the game so i just want to be able to see it so that's a lot easier said than done in today's environment because there are you know there's sides there's now there's so many people involved in the game but there's also so many great people involved in the game that i am excited for where it can go and i think the next step whatever the next thing that comes is going to be really exciting i just hope that it comes sooner rather than later um and with the pandemic that sort of set back uh, those conversations, I think a little bit further, uh, but that's not to say that what is right, what is here is not um, a good product. So the NWHL with its five, uh, six teams is operating um, and hopefully they can start playing soon so that we can actually watch some games. And the girls that are in the PWHPA um, hopefully can set up some showcases to uh, showcase the game to more and bigger audiences. And uh, eventually at the top of that pinnacle, those two come together and um, everybody just gets along. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be super. <laughs> One last thing I wanted to touch on before we let you go, Sammy. One of the messages I thought that was really compelling in your book, and it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're male or female and probably doesn't even matter if it's in sports, but the aspect of being a good teammate, you talked about that a lot. I mean, you had some hardship personally you had to deal with. You know, you were the you were the backup goalie in the 2002 Olympics and you were the third goalie in your other two Olympics. So you didn't actually get into any games. But, you know, personally that you talk about how much that hurt. But from a collective, you knew how important it was you had to be supportive for your team. And I think that's something that, you know, being a good teammate sounds like something that's easy to do. But, you know. Nobody wants to be the backup goalie or the second string quarterback, but somebody has to fill that role and they have to be prepared if they're called upon. So it's, it's something I thought that, you know, really is a lesson that everyone could learn. You're so right. I think nobody wants to be in that position. Um, somebody always has to be, and you never think it's going to be you. And you never think your team can possibly go on without you, but they do. So how do you come to terms with being in that supportive role? And, you know, I think having played all these other sports, Bob, you mentioned before, you know, the sports background made me realize that there were so many other people that had gone through this in all of the teams that I had ever played on. And so I, I tried to use their strength to be able to then support my teammates in that moment. Um, I think that, you know, having worked as a professional speaker for a long time, you know, uh, while writing this book, the stories that resonated the most with audience members were the ones um, about that particular um, uh, uh, issue was, you know, how do you support others when you want to be where they are? You know, how do you how do you sort of juxtapose the jealousy and envy with support? And that's not easy. Um, and, you know, there isn't a magic um, brushstroke that you can just suddenly have this amazing lesson that you learn. There is a grieving process. There's a grieving process to realizing that you will you will not be in that position, whether you know it's a big presentation at work, whether it's in maybe a family environment, 
and um, your kids, you know, choose to want to play with the husband rather than the wife, whatever it is, you know, there's, there's moments in all of our lives where we don't want it to be that way, but it is. So what can we do to make the environment better? How can we still feel a value? And part of that is that, you know, my teammates certainly helped with that and they made me feel valued. So that made me want to support them. And I think that when we create team, that's really important that everybody feels of value so that when I've, when people are put in these roles that we can, you know, lean on each other in these situations. Um, but I also tried to really live vicariously through them and realize that my emotions at that moment were, um, I needed to put them on the back burner because I, it could have gone two ways. I could have brought the team down with my negativity um, or I could have supported them as, you know, as they went to the gold medal game or, um, or a big presentation or whatever it is. Um, so you kind of have two choices and it's not easy. I mean, the days where uh, I was a backup goalie, um, you know, I often have to take time to myself because I, you know, I, I you know, you just, you still want to play in that big game. Um, however, I tried to, you know, tell the same jokes I always tell. I tried to fill the girls' water bottles. I tried to find a place and uh, on the bench cheered as loud as I possibly could and just tried to be there for them so that they felt the support in that moment. And I didn't sort of derail the team, but um, you know, I think we all go through those moments and I think we are all stronger than we think we are until we get into those moments. And um, that it's by no means is it something that I just, it magically was able to do. I think everybody does it on a daily basis and we don't give ourselves enough credit and we don't take pride in those moments. So that's what this book really allowed me to realize was that, you know, I did have a role. And while it wasn't the role I wanted to play, it certainly was a, a role that was important and um, that we all have important roles to play in our lives. Well, we want to thank you for joining us, Sammy Joe. It's uh, been a pleasure to have you on. You're our first, I believe, she's our first Olympic gold medalist we've had on, Kevin. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. so really appreciate it. And I got to tell you, I picked up your book on the weekend, and I started reading it, and I got so engrossed in it, I forgot I had an appointment and uh, missed my appointment. So that, that's a good sign for your book. That's a good story. I love it. Literally, I couldn't put it down. It's true. And uh, let's show the book one more time so everyone can see it. And Sammy Joe, I assume we can get the book uh, at all the usual places, Amazon, all the bookstores, online. It's yeah, I wherever you get your, your regular books, you can get it. It's pretty, it's pretty neat for me to be able to walk into a bookstore and it be there. It's uh, yeah. surreal at times. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us, and all yeah, the best. Thank, you, all, thank uh, you, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Okay, you have yourself a great day and sell a million books. Thanks for your time. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. But I thought that one, when I read the book, that was, to me, the most compelling part. You know, the talk about being a good teammate. And you think about the 2002 Olympics where she ended up being the backup goalie to Kim St. Pierre as they won the gold medal. And you think about Curtis Joseph at the 2002 Olympics when he played the first game for Canada. They got beat by Sweden. And his coach in Toronto, Pat Quinn, was his coach in the Olympics. And Pat Quinn rode Marty Brodeur the rest of the way. And that seemed to fracture the relationship forever between Joseph and uh, Quinn. For and sure. That's, that's the sign of not being a good teammate, I would say. Yeah, I mean, that's it's, that's really a uh, fascinating story as she was telling all that and you guys were talking about it. I'm, you know, um, as as most of our viewers know, you and I have uh, probably between the two of us written over 40 books. And I was thinking maybe we should collaborate on a book called Second String. Um, mm -hmm. We've talked about some of the great second stringers who've had uh, – you know, top performances, uh, you know, coming off the bench, but you know, what they went through for all those years, I, I'm trying to just trying to think of the quarterback that made a living, a really good living. As I recall, he made nine or $10 million in his career, but only threw about a hundred passes, uh, in his NFL career. You, you know, you know what I'm talking about? That, was, no, that wasn't Don Strzok, was it? It wasn't Strzok. It was something recently. He just recently retired. I think. Oh, is that Josh McCown? Uh, no, no, he played a lot more than that. This, this guy hadn't played very much. Uh, but anyway, I mean, it is, it does take a certain amount of uh, the right personality and the right attitude to uh, be a backup, knowing that, uh, you know, not only do you have to serve a role when you're not playing, like cheerleading, as she talked about, and uh, 
uh, just keeping everyone up and, and a lot of guys, uh, and, uh, and, and in this case, women, um, uh, you know, find that trying to be the court jester helps too. Uh, you know, Kudobin talked about that a little bit about how he likes to keep everyone loose when he's just the backup, uh, goalie, but then every once in a while they tap you on the shoulder and say, Hey, you got to go in there and win it for us. And, uh, whatever you're, um, you know, uh, whether you're, uh, you know, a pinch hitter in baseball or, a, you know, a, uh, utility player or in football player, the backup quarterback, or, you know, uh, Sammy Joe, the backup goalie, there's always a position in sports where, you know, the backup never plays. Yeah, I mean, you think of somebody like Earl Morrill, who, you know, was a backup for most of his career, but, you know, comes in for an injured Johnny Unitas and leads the Colts to the Super Bowl. And then uh, sure. more famously comes in for the injured Bob Greasy during Miami's perfect season and kept them going until Greasy was healthy and, you know, and basically right it to the playoffs. So, you know, it's, there's a perfect example of, you know, being a good teammate and being ready when they need you. Well, you hear that in hockey uh, quite a lot about how many times have you and I heard, you know, he's a good backup goalie. Like, uh, yeah, he can carry a team for a short period of time. Um, but then, you know, he can't carry the load for 55 or 60 games. And, you know, we've seen players like that. That uh, a long discussion with Glenn Healy about that role. As he was, you know, he had his time with the Islanders, certainly that great Stanley Cup run they had in 93. But for most of his career, he was a backup goalie. Right. We had a long discussion about how you fill that role. And it's really, it is a very thankless job because you usually get, you know, mostly you get road games and you're going to get the second game and back to backs usually. And you're going to get put in in scenarios where, you know, logically the team's probably not going to have success. So you're going to be, you know, literally asked to take one for the team. And, yeah. you know, yeah, and in, in practice, you know, the backup goalie doesn't get to leave the ice till all the players are done. You know, if somebody wants to stay out there and work on something with their game, you stay out there too. And then it, it could be two hours, you know, you, you out there, you're do, that's your part of your role. I mean, that's again, being a good teammate and doing what you're needed to do. You're helping your other teammates hone their skills at right. you know, own expense where, you know, you're, you know, you're not going to play, but you're helping to hopefully make them better so you win the next game. Yeah, and it's, you know, one of the um, least talked about but, a, but an important aspect of being a good backup goalie is to be a shoulder for the number one goalie to uh, lean on, um, you know, to be the confidant, to, to, to be a guy that uh, can uh, uh, pat you on the back when uh, things aren't going well and or, um, you know, be able to say to you, you know, I, I noticed that, uh, you know, you're not closing your path. Uh, you know, the guy to be really, really helpful. There's nothing worse on a team when the backup goalie thinks he should be the number one goalie and then, you know, they're not speaking or, you know, they don't have a good relationship. I mean, oftentimes that's the key to being a good backup goalie is to have a good relationship with the number one goalie because uh, the coaches want to see that. You know, they don't want any animosity between the top uh, uh, two goalies on the team. And you, you think back to the, you know, in the mid-60s when they first started dressing the two-goalie system and into the 70s and really up until the 80s, you know, there was no goalie coach. There was no uh, video really at all. So you really had to rely on that other goalie. If you were struggling, he was the only one that really, A, understood what you were going through and, B, could – analyze it and tell you what maybe you're not doing right no that's that's for sure and just think how far goalies have come where um you know it, it was a reflex position for so many years and then um like everything else um we brought in analysis and we brought in video and now uh, you know there's not much reflex um goaltending allowed it's it's all calculated um, you know what you should do in this situation, and uh, and and so forth. I mean, you know, instincts still play a role in the in the wild. Uh, you know, when you're just trying to react. But uh, you know, one of the things that people always talk about Dominic Hasek is that he always looked like he played out of control. But he, you know, all of his uh, acrobatics 
were all calculated on his part. Like if you talk to him, he would tell you that, you know, he would throw his arm way up sometimes behind him. Well, the reason he's done that is that he had learned through the years that if he does that, that one time out of 10, he'll catch the puck um, of doing that. So, you know, he started doing that and, you know, he calculates his odds of what he could do in that case that gives him the best opportunity, even if it's a small opportunity, but the best opportunity to do the puck. He, uh, Dominic Hasek did nothing that wasn't uh, calculated that he hadn't thought about that, you know, there was a reason why he did those things. He just didn't just do it willy nilly. Uh, he had an idea of what he was uh, doing when he would uh, throw his arm out or um, do some of the, or, you know, dive back across the net. Some of the things he would do that looked instinctual were, were far from it. Yeah. And you think about, you know, the famous Mike Bossy line that he said, he doesn't see goalie. He sees net. Well, 98% of NHLers and all hockey players, they see goalie. They don't see net. So my yeah. thing as a goalie myself was put something out there and most guys are going to hit it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny you can bring that up. Uh, uh, Mario Lemieux told me one time when he was talking about the uh, difference when the game changed for him is, is that he said, you know, when you're a, a sniper, when you're uh, an elite goal scorer, just as you said, you know, the puck comes to you. The game's so fast. Like, it's it's much faster now than it was when Mario was playing. But back then, to those guys, it was incredibly fast. And you're making uh, split-second decisions. And he said, you know, the puck would, would come to you, and you'd be in a shooting area. And he said, you'd look up, and you'd see a little corner of the net, and you'd fire you know, that's all you need. You need just a little, you need a little sliver, you know, like a, a mail slot, um, you know, in a door. And he said, I'd see that slot and I'd fire. And he goes, and then all of a sudden after, you know, they started adding uh, layers of clothing and goalies who were wearing a 48 to jersey started to wear, you know, 58. And, uh, you know, all extra pads and they look like the Michelin uh, man and everything else. He said, well, all of a sudden I'd get that quick look and I'd look up. I, I didn't see my mail slot. You know, I didn't see that area. All I saw was, you know, the goalie. And he said, you know, we need to get that back. Like, you know, he thought that the goalie's equipment needed to shrink. So he said, you know, we don't need to see much, but we need to see a little. We need to see a little of the net. Give us something to shoot at um, because we'll be able to hit it. And uh, I think they have done that, obviously. Um, and they've streamlined the equipment a little bit. The, the goalies still don't look like they did when, you know, Ken Dryden played for the Canadians in the 70s. But, uh, you know, they don't look quite as puffy as they did uh, during the, you know, the heyday of the uh, of the extra padding uh, era of the NHL. I remember Mickey Redmond telling me he gave Gordie Howe a lot of the credit for, you know, his 50-goal seasons in Detroit because he said when he got to the Red Wings, Gordy took him out on the ice at practice one day and repositioned his head, basically. So where his view of the net was changed. And he said he was amazed that just the adjustment of a few inches of where his head was when he was carrying the puck, he could see so much more net than he could in his previous, you know, just turning sure. on the goalie. And he said it was just a, a subtle little thing, but he said it made a world of difference. And he said that's how – brilliant Gordy Howe was, he could see that and show him how to do it. And he went from being a guy who was scoring 20 goals a year to a guy who was scoring 50 goals a year. Yeah. Well, you know, Gordy Howe was just, you know, incredible. I, you know, there's just so many great stories about, I was just retelling someone about that, uh, you know, Gordy would play, you know, 40 plus minutes a game and he wanted to rest and go back and play defense. But, you know, that, you know, it was a younger person I was telling that story to, and they were just flabbergasted by that. Uh, that you, you'd go back and play some defense so you could rest and then, you know, go back on the forward line. And, you know, the great Bill Gads, me, you know, now we, if a player plays 27 minutes or something in a game, it's phenomenal. And, um, and Bill Gads once told me, if I didn't play 40 minutes a game, because they only use four defensemen, really. Uh, he said, if I didn't play 40 minutes, I didn't think I was doing my job. So uh, it's a different time now. Yeah, and speaking of time, we're out of time. As usual, we've run over our time, but uh, we'll be back with you on Thursday with another great guest and more compelling hockey talk. This has been the HockeyDebates.com podcast. I'm Bob. He's Kevin, and we'll see you all on Thursday afternoon. <laughs>